Welcome to Mainland Television Regional News. I'm Graham O'Brien and coming up in today's bulletin, youngsters saved from drowning, diabetes club for those at risk, volunteers are honoured and is 1080 a cause for concern plus much more. Now some police along with the Coast Guard averted a tragedy yesterday but what they said was a narrow margin when two children and two teenagers were rescued from the water off Rocks Road shortly before 8pm. The group were in an inflatable boat, described as best suited for use in a para pool, and had ventured across the harbour to Hawlishaw Island. Constable Cogger said that the quick work by the Coast Guard, surf rescue and nearby road workers prevented a loss of life. He said by the time rescuers reached them, the group were exhausted and unable to help themselves. All four were taken to hospital by ambulance, suffering the effects of hypothermia and taking on seawater. I spoke to Harbour Master Dave Duncan about this near tragedy. So far it's been a good summer for Nelson, no deaths on the water, but unfortunately yesterday we had a pretty, pretty close call. We're going to ask Dave about what happened. Yeah, good morning Graham and thanks for the opportunity. Um, my understanding is, is like this. Fortunately a lot of the people in the uh, Port Hills were, were watching over the water and we're very grateful for to, to them and the calls they make when they see something unfolding which they believe is underwater. And uh, one of the Coast Guard members uh, was driving past and saw four young people on Hall of Shore Island attempting to get into a, uh, an inflatable dinghy, something that should never have been in the ocean in the first place. But these guys were trying to get this inflatable dinghy across from, back across from Hollishaw Island to, uh, to Rocks Road. The wind was up, the tide was ra ra raging, and uh, it was just some very poor decision making to go there in the first place. However, they're young. What, 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 you know, what do they know? Where was the guidance from mum and dad? And what I can't believe is not one of those four, seven, eight, I think 16 and 18 year olds, something like that, not one of those four had a life jacket. And what have we got to do, mate, to get the message out, really? I mean, you know, we're going to have somebody die on these waters sooner or later. And it's only because we have people keep a close lookout that do care that stop. And, and fortunately for me, this Coast Guard member uh, saw what was unfolding, called out Surf Life Saving straight away. He stopped and these uh, young people just managed to get within uh, range for them to get into the water and uh, pick up one of these little ch children just as they went under the water, possibly for the last time. And uh, when I got there, the ambulance had arrived and the children were on their way to the hospital. Where was mum and dad? I don't know, but mum and dad have got to take some responsibility for this. It's not down to the 18 year old. If it's down to me, I'd make sure every one of them went through a day skipper's course at seven years old and onwards. <laughs> but uh, there you go. And um, so what we've got to do, I don't know. But um, I certainly hope I'm not standing here at any time in my life talking about somebody that's actually died. And this is the third time on that water between Hawlishaw Island and Rocks Road that someone's come close. So, uh, you know, let's be smarter. Let's be smarter on the water. Wear the life jacket, keep the warm clothes on and uh, let someone know where you're going. Thanks very much, Dave. That's great. Cheers, Graham. A 54-year-old woman who drowned on the weekend has been named. Virginia Lee Smith from Nelson drowned while swimming with her partner at Takao Bay between the Bay of Islands and Whangaroa Harbour on Saturday. Sergeant Ross Laurie of Kitty Kitty said Smith's 64-year-old partner went back to help her but on his third attempt realised he was out of his depth. Teenage cousins Brenton Tua and Sido Tua rushed with boogie boards to help, bring the man to shore and search for the woman. Kitty Kitty man Aaron Wood, who witnessed the tragedy unfolding, hailed the teenagers' efforts. He said the boys were absolutely incredible, hailing them as heroes and putting their own lives at risk. A witness said the woman's partner was trying to do his best to resuscitate Virginia. A number of people performed CPR on Smith, but she was pronounced dead by the St John ambulance crew when they arrived around 12.15. The drowning comes after figures released this month showed that 90 people had drowned in the 2014 national toll, down from 107 the previous year. The Nelson Tasman's region had two deaths attributed to drowning in last year's national figures. Water Safety New Zealand Chief Executive Matt Claridge said that while the total numbers had consistently tracked downwards over recent years, New Zealand was still ranked among the three worst countries in the developed world for drowning. A house fire in Motueka yesterday took 25 firefighters from fire appliances and tankers from Richmond as well as Motueka, Kiri, Kaitiritiri, Mapua and Motueka rural firefighters to help save a wooden house in King Edward Street on Monday afternoon. 
Marawika Volunteer Fire Brigade Chief Mike Riddle said the roof of the house was totally destroyed, but otherwise the fire looked worse than it was, and the rest of the house suffered mostly water damage. Mike Riddle said the occupants would have been unaware that the fire had been building up in the roof. Riddle said one firefighter needed to be treated in the ambulance at the scene for heat exhaustion. He said it was too early to say what had caused the fire, but that an investigator was working on the case today. The owner was not at home when the fire broke out, but family members were in the backyard and noticed the fire when it broke through a wall, managing to get some water on it from a garden hose. However, the fire was mostly contained to the roof cavity and remained contained there. Local Nelson lawyer John Fitchett forked out for holiday flights to New Zealand for a Brazilian woman who was responsible for catching killer and pedophile New Zealander Philip Smith in Rio de Janeiro in November last year. She had recognised Smith from TV news footage and called police after she saw him staying in the hotel where she worked. He was using the alias James Andrews. Smith had skipped New Zealand while on prison release in Auckland on November 6th. The woman's actions, a week later, led to him being deported back to New Zealand on November the 27th. Rio de Janeiro was a huge city and Fitchett had never expected Smith to be found so soon. He will get to meet the woman only briefly along with her mother, who is joining her for the holiday at Auckland Airport, as he is heading overseas himself on March 5th. Fitchett, who has hosted a Brazilian student in his Nelson home before, said he hoped his actions would help foster relations between Brazil and New Zealand. Viewer donations to television program Seven Sharp will be funding the woman and her mother's accommodation and activities in New Zealand. Nelson Diabetes Club is an exclusive and we managed to get club coordinator Joan Whip in to talk about how people could join up. We have Joan Whip in the studio with us today um, to inform us a little bit about the Diabetes Club. Um, Joan, thanks for coming along. And You're welcome. Thanks. Um, and can you tell us a little bit about the Diabetes Club? Well, um, it was formed to... I went to a, a seminar, I suppose you'd call it, uh, run by B. Williamson, who's the um, Diabetes Coordinator in Nelson. And one of the things that they said was a lot of people wanted a support group for people with, with diabetes. So um, I thought, well, I'd like that as well, and the only way to get it going is to start it. If you want. So, <laughs> yeah, if you want it, do something about <laughs> it. <laughs> oh, great, so you set up as a support group. Now, and please tell us a, a little bit about what is diabetes? It's, it's a bit of a mystery for a lot of people. Well, um, there are two things that can go wrong. One is that the pancreas isn't uh, making insulin, which which deals with sugar yep. in the body. Um, the other is that the insulin isn't being taken up by the cells in the body. Okay. So um, basically, th those are the two types of diabetes. Okay. And very very basic. <laughs> very basic. Thank you. And what sort of age group can you get these at any ages, or we've got um, certain times we have to worry about it? N no. It's, well, type two diabetes tends to be people who are older. Um, it's people who have relatives with diabetes are at risk, um, and as you get older, uh, Maori and Pacific Islanders tend to be more at risk. Um, if you have high blood pressure, high cholesterol, um, if you are told you're pre-diabetic, then you really need to watch it. Yeah. So yeah, those are basically the. Okay, and you say that after a 30... Oh, being, being overweight too, so being overweight. Is, 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 is one. <laughs> is a big one. <laughs> which is my sin. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you say that over 30, um, you've got, you're more at risk. Is there some way we, we can lower these risks? Is it about a healthy lifestyle? Um, or? Choose your ancestors. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, basically it's, it's try to watch your weight. Yeah. If it starts going up, try to do something about it. And how about the foods? We, is there any foods we should kind of stay away from? Or more than not, what we normally try, should stay away from? Not particularly. I mean, sugar in itself isn't bad, but um, carbs and, and fats tend to put on weight. So if you're putting on weight, those are the, bits, those are the things to watch, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, and we're all watching our weight all the time for, <laughs> many, for many reasons, aren't we? <laughs> Um, <laughs> and um, is, is, your, is the Diabetes Club just for people with diabetes or is it open to a wider, a wider group? Um, it's for anybody with diabetes or if you've been told that you're at risk or if you're pre-diabetic. If you have someone in your family or a close friend who's 
diabetic, you want to know more about it, just come along yeah, yeah. and you're welcome. Great. Yeah. That's, that's great. And um, what does the club, what does the Diabetes Club do for, it, uh, for its members? Well, we have a get together once a month. Um, we try to have an interesting speaker um, and we can all have a chat and a cuppa after the speaker's finished <laughs> talking um, and learn more from each other really. Yeah. And, and how do you feel when, when people are diagnosed with di diabetes? Is it quite a shock to the, you have new people coming in, is it quite, sho uh, quite shocking for them? Some people have said that it was a shock for them. Um, others just seem to take it in their stride. Um, my shock was when I was told I was putting on weight because I could never put on weight when I was younger. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's finding out what you need to do about it really. Yeah. That's the. And is it a big lifestyle change where if you if you're diagnosed with diabetes? Really, the sorts of things that diabetic diabetics should be eating are the healthy foods that the whole family should be eating, really. So we should just change the lifestyle we should be leading. We, we, anyway. we all should. I think. <laughs> Being overweight is a is a problem in New Zealand, a yeah. growing problem in New Zealand. We've been told so. Mm. Yeah, sure. And um, how do you um, fund your activities? I know you have monthly meetings and you, and you have get-togethers. Well, we're lu we're lucky enough to have a um, a room supplied free where we can have our meetings. So it's only really um, the tea, coffee, etc. That. Um, that we fund, and oh, that's okay. gold coin, coin yeah. donation. So, and that's fair. That's, that's yeah. great. The community. We, we would like to grow. We would yeah. like more more people to come. Yeah. And how many and how many people do you actually have on uh, on your books at the moment? It, the people coming can vary from four to fifteen. Yeah. And if we're having a speaker, we would rather be on the fifteen side than <laughs> yeah, the four. Sure. <laughs> Because we, we looked at some t statistics just before and we found out that 5% of the population mm. have diabetes and that's um, 6,000, over 6,000. And they say there are a lot of people who don't know that they have diabetes, that haven't been diagnosed. So, And, and is it a quite an easy, is it quite an easy quick, quick test? Just a blood test. Oh, they do have a, um, a glucose tolerance test, um, which is takes longer, they t do a blood test and then they get you to drink and then they do another blood yeah. test later um, to see how, how you've managed that glucose that you, yeah. glucose intake. But generally speaking, it's just an ordinary blood test. And then if, if people were worried that they might be being diabetic, what are some of the symptoms that they might be looking for to go and have one of these tests just to make sure? Um, thirst, intense thirst, yeah. um, frequent urination, um, tiredness. I must say I didn't notice any of those. <laughs> I didn't have any symptoms <laughs> that I could judge. But yeah, that they people tend tend to say, "Oh, I've been very very thirsty lately," okay. and uh, I'm running backwards and forwards. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's the one. <laughs> All right. Oh, well, thanks very much, Joan. That's, that's fantastic, and, and we, we hope that people have watched today got a bit of information. And if they need some support, come along. I hope they will. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. The club is meeting later this month on Friday the 30th of January from 1.30pm at Nick Smith Rooms in Waimea Road. And we'll have a speaker, Tanya Barrow, who is a supplier of diabetic friendly foods. All you need to bring is yourself and a gold coin donation. Fundraising is still required for a large sculpture to be installed as an entrance point to the Ruby Coast area for the cost of $58,000 and is now only $9,000 away from target. Sculpture project leaders are using the crowdfunding internet facility Give A Little to reach the goal. Unlike Nelson's Gateway Sculptures, this Tasman Township Seaside Sculpture has been designed in a cooperative collaboration by local artists and will be a stainless steel sculpture with silhouette cutouts of birds found in the Mootry Inlet with an information panel about local bird life and an acknowledgement of major sponsors. It will be located on the small nub of land at the north end of the town where the coastal road was rerouted to link with the bypass. The project is a joint venture between the Ruby Coast Initiative Trust and a group of artists from Ruby Coast area. It was decided in consultation with local artists, businesses and community members to create a set of three sculptures of a contemporary and enduring nature as an attractive gateways to the area, which would foster a sense of community pride and artistic richness. 
The money already raised has come from the local community grants and Tasman District Council. Many materials and services have also been donated. To donate for this project, go online to Give a Little website with the link Ruby Coast Sculpture. 1080 is the leading suspect in the disappearance of a rare native bird species in the Alpine area of Kaharangi National Park. It seems that since the last September 1080 drop in the Kaharangi, none of the 36 endangered rock wren monitored by DOC have been since been seen. Richard Prosser of New Zealand First has come out in a statement saying that to suggest that the only truly alpine bird in New Zealand which overwinters in the alpine zone could have disappeared due to snow is ludicrous. He also said in his statement that another suggestion from Doc that the disappearance of the rock wren is due to possible predatory activity doesn't wash either. Especially, he said, given that the reason for the 1080 program was the incidence of rats due to a large beech seed production. He said that rats don't live at the altitude of the rock wren. Before Christmas, the Department of Conservation said it could not find 25 rare and endangered rock wren in the Grange Range of the Tasman Wilderness Area in Kaharangi National Park which was subject to a 1080 drop for the first time in October. Doc Westport Conservation Services Manager Doc Bob Dickinson said under the Official Information Act that they had identified 39 birds before the drop, with 30 which he claims were sighted directly after the operation, but only 14 had been found later. It seems that this exercise has become a study that Doc has not done before after Dixon said the Grange range was included in the operation to learn about the risks and benefits to the rock wren from the aerial 1080 control. And finally, Waimarama Brook Bird Sanctuary is going from strength to strength and I caught up with the busy Hudson Dodd to find out about the latest accolade the people from behind the scenes have been awarded. Hudson, Nelsonians of the Year for the Environment. I mean, you've got to be pretty stoked with that, with that title. Absolutely. You know, the, uh, the volunteer core of the Brook Sanctuary is one of the most inspiring parts of the Nelson community, in my humble opinion. You know, there's 400 people at any snapshot in time pouring their blood, sweat, and tears into this project to make it happen. And to have them collectively recognized as Nelsonian of the Year for the Environment is um, a very worthy recognition, uh, well-deserved, and we're all um, thrilled for them because uh, they work their butts off to make this project happen. I'm sure they do. There's some hot, hard work going on up there at the moment, I imagine. That's right. You know, the, the work is divided into teams and many hands make less work. Um, uh, but the, uh, the collective effort is on the order of 30,000 hours of labor a year, uh, without which the project simply would not be coming to fruition, as it is. So you've, um, you've got the funding for the fences. You've got lots of volunteers up there. So does that mean you don't need any more funding now? You're set to go? Well, the reality is we have raised the money needed to build the pest-proof fence, which is the biggest significant cost of the project, $4.7 million. Uh, and those funds are in place, and that's why we're going ahead with building the fence, so that's fantastic, and we're extremely grateful to the community and the, and the wider support that we've received for that. Uh, that said, there are additional costs of developing the sanctuary um, as a visitor attraction. So there's tracks and bridges for, for uh, you know, pedestrians to explore the sanctuary um, and other facilities, you know, interpretive signage and uh, all the things that go into making a visitor attraction. So we are still in fundraising mode. Um, and the good news is there are still plenty of fence posts in the fence to be sponsored, yeah. each of which comes with a uh, recognition plaque so you can put your name or a loved one's name or a message um, on it, um, all for the price of $100, um, which uh, then is a, a legacy gift that you can give to someone or for yourself. Uh, and so there, there are still plenty of fence posts to be sponsored, and we are still looking for that support. Fantastic idea. And um, with all the work that you've been doing up there with the trapping, have you seen an increase in, in bird life already? Um, the trapping efforts uh, over the last seven years have paid off dramatically. Um, over 30,000 pest animals have already been removed from the site. But the reality is without um, a defined barrier such as a fence or a body of water, uh, the, the mammals keep coming. You know, they keep breeding and they keep coming in. So it's a, uh, a never-ending battle. Um, we have seen an increase in bird life in the sanctuary thanks to the, the pest control that's been done to date through the trapping. Um, but that uh, resurgence of bird life has plateaued, um, indicating that we've done what you can do without a fence. So that's why we are still going to all the effort of building this pest-proof fence, 
um, to create that defined barrier that will keep all the mammals at bay and allow us to then begin to reintroduce some of the most sensitive native species that cannot withstand even a handful of uh, these introduced predators, such as rats and stoats and possums, can just decimate um, a small local population of some of the most native iconic species, such as tuatara and uh, little uh, little brown kiwi and um, uh, saddlebacks and mohua yellowheads and so forth. Yes, all right. Thanks very much. And for your great efforts and for Nelson, and we'll be talking to you soon. Thanks very much, Graham. We appreciate all the support. Cheers. After the break, we'll bring you the latest weather update and some events and happenings coming up from around the region. <laughs> 